Power series are, to a certain extent, like polynomials. And there are many computations in mathematics that are easier with power series than with other functions. For instance, limits. In this video, I will illustrate with some examples how to use Taylor series to compute limits. Before I get to real examples, here is a very easy calculation. I want to compute the limit as x approaches 0 of this quotient of polynomials. And perhaps you can tell me what the answer is right away without doing anything. But if I want to justify the steps, what we can do is factor out x cubed both in the top and the bottom. And now I can cancel the x cube because it's the same on both, and I am left with a limit that I know how to compute. As x approaches 0, this is 2 over 5. But another way to look at this is to say that in the original limit, the only terms that matter are the terms with the smallest exponent. Change any coefficients you want for the other terms, it won't alter the fact that the limit is 2 over 5. So when I have a limit as x approaches 0 of a quotient of polynomials, just keep the term with the smallest exponent, everything else is irrelevant. Now, polynomials are the easiest ones. How can I use the same idea for other functions? My first real example is this. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x minus x over x cubed. We saw how easy the previous example was. But that's because the top and bottom were both polynomials. Unfortunately, sine of x is not a polynomial. But it is an analytic function. I can write sine of x as a power series. And power series are pretty much as good as polynomials. So I'm going to do the same thing and see if it makes the limit equally easy. What I wrote here is the Maclaurin expansion for sine of x. And now I notice that the x cancels with this minus x. So I'm going to be left with an expansion that begins with minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed. And I am anticipating what's about to happen. I don't think I need all those terms. In fact, the term x to the 5 is also not going to be needed. Because now that I have this, I can divide everything by x cubed, and it simplifies. and I am left with a limit that I know how to compute. The answer is given by this first term, is minus 1 over 6, and the other terms are irrelevant. And just like in the example before, I can notice that the only term that really mattered was the first term, the first non-zero term, the term with the smallest exponent that has a non-zero coefficient. Everything else was irrelevant for the purpose of the limit. This is going to be my general strategy. If I have a limit as x approaches 0 of a quotient, and both functions can be written as power series, then I'm going to do that. But I actually don't need the full power series. I just need to find the first term that is non-zero, the one with the smallest exponent, and that's all that will matter to compute the limit. Okay, this example was actually a simple one. We could have used L'Hopital's rule to calculate this three times, and it could have been fine, and certainly could have given us the right answer. So let's move on to another example that is more complicated. This is my second example. I want to compute the limit as x approaches 0 of this complicated expression. This is an indeterminate form of type 0 over 0. So you can try to use L'Hopital's rule for it. But the computations get pretty messy after a while, and probably you will give up in the process. I think it is easier to solve this using power series. So I'm going to do that. Following the previous example, what I want to do is take the numerator and write it as a power series centered at 0. But I only care about the smallest non-zero term, and then I stop. And then for the denominator, I will also look for the smallest non-zero term, and then stop. In the numerator, I have the sum of these three terms, 3x squared minus e to the x squared plus cos 2x. And I can write it one of them as a power series center at zero. There is nothing to do for 3x squared. It's already a monomial. I know how to write e to the x as a Maclaurin series, but I'm going to use x squared instead of x as the variable. Here are the first few terms. Similarly, I know how to write cosine of x as a Maclaurin series, but I need to use 2x instead of x as the argument. Here are the first few terms. And hopefully they are enough. And now I'm going to combine them all. And remember that I don't need the full power series. I'm just looking for the first term that is not zero. I have two independent terms. I have this one here and this one here. But when I put them together, I get minus one plus 1. 
So they cancel. I got zero for that. Well, I will look next at the next smallest term and I see x squared. And I have three terms with x squared. This one, this one, and this one. And the coefficients are three in here, minus one, plus minus four over two. So that's three, minus one, minus two, that's also zero. This term also cancels, so I need to keep going. Next, I have some terms with x to the fourth. This term and this term. And the coefficient I get now is minus one half plus two to the fourth over four factorial. Great. This is the first term that's not going to vanish. This is not zero. So that's the only term I need. I don't need to worry about what the rest is. So this cancels. This is zero. This cancels. This is zero. This is minus one half plus 16 over 24, which simplifies as 1 over 6. Write the intermediate steps if necessary. So the first non-zero term is 1 over 6 times x to the fourth. And then I have more terms. I'm going to abbreviate this as HOT, which means higher order terms. And the point is, I don't care what they are. This is the only one that I'm going to need for the limit. That was the numerator. In the denominator, I have x sine x minus ln of 1 plus x squared. So like before, let's write a power series for each one of them. I have here an x multiplying, and I know how to write the Maclaurin series for sine of x. As for the other part, is logarithm of 1 plus x squared. And I know what the series for logarithm of 1 plus x is. So now I need to use x squared instead of x as the variable. And I hope those terms are enough. So like before, I'm going to group terms with the same exponent and see what the first non-zero term is. First, in this case, the smallest terms are the ones with x squared, and I have two of them, this x times x and this x squared. But in this case, the coefficient is 1 minus 1. So that is 0, that won't be it. Well, next, I'm going to have, in this case, terms with x to the fourth. I have this one and this one. And the coefficient now is plus minus 1 over 3 factorial, which is minus 1 over 6, minus minus plus 1 over 2. All right, that's it. This term doesn't vanish. It's not zero, so I can stop. I don't need anything else. And this is 1 half minus 1 six, which is 1 third of x to the fourth. And like before, plus higher order terms. So I've done it. I have now the numerator and the denominator as a power series, just the smallest term. That's going to be enough. Let's finish computing this limit. I will copy what I have. I will replace both the numerator and the denominator with the first term of the corresponding power series. And like in the previous examples, the only thing that matters is what these two coefficients are. That's why you need to know those higher order terms. So this limit is going to be 1 over 6 divided by 1 over 3, which simplifies as 1 over 2, which is the final answer. And it may seem that the calculation I did was uh, long and complex, but it wasn't really. Once you've done a few of these, it will be much faster. And in particular, this is much faster than trying to apply L'Hopital's rule four times, because you have a four in here, to this expression. Try it if you want, and you will see that the calculations get messier. To conclude, here is the secret. Your calculus professor, whoever they are, barely ever uses L'Hopital's rule. They always use this method to compute limits.